Thank you, Shari. In case you didn't know, that's my daughter. Yeah, I'll give an amen to that. (laughs) And you know what's so great? I went into my office kind of in between things and saw a bag there for Pastor Bill McClendon. Occasionally people leave little things and I thought, well, who could this be? I didn't recognize the writing. They certainly didn't expect my daughter to refer to me as Pastor Bill McClendon. But when I looked inside, about three dozen chocolate chip cookies. Pretty good, huh? I'm one of those that, that don't give me just one cookie. I'd, I'd rather not even start. You know, there, there, it has to be a certain amount to really enjoy the blessing or it's just not worth it. And she knows me well, so thank you for that. Hey, I want to continue the message that we started last week. You know, last week we had a lot of things going on. We had a a baptism and some people being welcomed into our church. We had some ordination services, a dedicate. We had about everything that could happen except a marriage, a marriage and a funeral. But uh, this week, so I I just kind of teed it up, just kind of set the stage. The problem with doing that and now continuing it is some of you heard it and some of you didn't. So I, I need to set it back up so that we can go into our message. It's really taken from a, 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 a text in the book of Romans. It's, uh, it's Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 is where we're, we're really resonating. That's, that's where all of this flows, and I'll read it for you here in just a minute. Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. Here's what the Bible says. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Isn't that good news? Wow, that's a powerful statement. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. I was sharing a little bit of my story, how I came to know the Lord and I became a Seventh-day Adventist really at the same time. It was through public evangelistic meeting that the Seventh-day Adventist Church does so well and blesses so many people through that that we lead people to Jesus. You know, some say, well, all you do is reach other Christians, and that's not true. I was not a Christian. I was not living for the Lord. I was completely living apart from any relationship with God, and I came to that meeting, and I, and I saw, and I... I I was, I was introduced to Jesus for the first time. And that's a powerful thing because we live in a world where everybody hears about Jesus. It's hard not to have some, at least, knowledge of what others are saying about him. But when you really get to know him, that's when the theoretical becomes experiential. And so my life was changed. I made a decision to give my life to the Lord and to be baptized, and I became a Seventh-day Adventist. I want you to know that I was prejudiced against Seventh-day Adventists. And the reason I was prejudiced against Seventh-day Adventists is I'd never heard of them. It wasn't that I had any good information that led me to believe that I was skeptical or whatever else. The, the, the real story, and I don't know if I've ever told it, was my mother wanted to go to these meetings. It was her that encouraged me to go. And she did that because she knew that something was happening in my life. You know, God's people have a way of looking into someone else's life, and even though they haven't surrendered their life yet, they can kind of see what God is doing. They can sense what the Holy Spirit, my mother was that way. And she wanted, she wanted me to continue that journey, to take that next step. And so she invited me to go to the meeting. What she said was, I want to go to a meeting and your father won't drive me. She was one of those that didn't drive after dark. And so she said, if you come over, I'll feed you dinner. I was a single guy at the time. And, uh, you know, Taco Bell and and KFC and all those other things. And the home-cooked meal sounded pretty good. So I agreed to do that. And so I went over, we had dinner, and then we, it's a 7 o'clock meeting, so we got out in the car. And as we get into the car, I said, where are we going? And she said, we're going to the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I said, we're not going there. I said, no way. I I don't know why I said that. I don't know whatever led me to believe that it was a problem, but there was just something about it that caused me to throw up that resistance. And I said, no, we're not going there. 
we're Presbyterians, even though I hadn't been in the church in a long time. You know how it is. You, you're raised, you, you know, you just, you're that way. And so she did what I used to do when I was a little kid, when I didn't get my way. She threw a fit right there in the car. Oh, we're dressed. That's what she said. Well, Mom, I usually am dressed. What do you mean? We're dressed. We're ready to go. Come on, let's just go. And I remember what I said to her. I said, all right, we're going, but if they do anything funny, we're leaving. (laughs) Well, we got in there, and there wasn't any funny business going on. The only thing that was going on there was some Bible preaching. And oh, I mean, I, within 30 seconds, you know, my guard was up, and it should. It should. We're told that we're to test all things. We're to prove all things. We're to hold fast to that which is good. And so within 30 seconds, you know, they came out, and they, they prayed, and I heard Jesus' name, and I heard, I heard him refer to the Father, and then we opened the Bible, and I looked at the Bible they were using, and sure enough, it was just like mine, and, and I knew everything was going to be okay. Well, when it was over, as I said, I... I, I, I I made that decision that I wanted to be a part of it. I talked about last week a movement, that not just a church. You know, God doesn't want just another church. He's looking for a movement. He's looking for people, and I don't care where you are, where you live, whatever. God is raising up men and women that are going to be ready to meet him. And I tell you, that is not just meaning that you're a member of a certain church or your name's on the book there. What really matters is your name in heaven. Is your name written there? That's what's going to matter. And I wanted to be a part of that. I shared the experience at work. People were talking about me. Because that's what will happen. When you start living for the Lord, the neighbors are going to talk about you guys. They're going to realize things are different in your home. That you're starting to act differently. And certainly at work they noticed that. And I had that experience of going with someone. We were having a great time. I was witnessing. I was sharing my faith with this guy. And all of a sudden he asked, what church do you go to? And I told him, and I, and I shared last week, it looked like he got sick. I mean, it looked like he was choking on his food. He'd, he, it was not the kind of thing that I thought. I thought he would just, oh, that's cool. But it wasn't that. He got quiet. He got silent. He ate as fast as I've ever seen anybody eat. And he, we went back to work, and I, and I was trying to uh, wrestle through that. I was trying to unpack that. What did I do wrong? And so I was sharing that with some people in the church the next Sabbath, and they said, well, one person said this. They said, oh, Bill, when somebody asks you what, what, what church you go to, I don't tell them. I don't tell them. And they said, I don't like what it does to them. Hmm. So I was chewing on that, and I was really wrestling with this because I didn't think that was right, but I didn't want a repeat experience of what had happened. And so, I don't know, days later, weeks later, somebody else was talking to me at church, and, or at work, and they said, what church do you go to? And, or actually, they didn't. They started talking to me, and I was doing everything I could to steer the conversation away so they would not ask. And I went home that night, and I came across this verse. Let me read it again. It's Romans chapter 1 and verse 16. The Apostle Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, For it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Man, when I read that text, after praying like that and after trying to be evasive and and all of that, my heart was pricked. I mean, I felt guilty of not, well, of being ashamed. I really did. Now, friends, before I knew Jesus, there are a lot of things in my past that I have right to be ashamed of. But once I gave my life to Jesus, I have no reason to be ashamed of what he has done. I have no reason to be ashamed of the gospel. I have no reason to be ashamed of anything as it relates to God and God's work in our life. I know sometimes it's hard. When you're surrounded by people that are not Christians, and maybe an opening comes up, or, a, you know, as it were, an opportunity, and you could say something... For your Lord. And there is often an overwhelming temptation not to do that. The devil whispers in your ear, don't tell anybody. And sometimes we turn away. We turn away from that. I decided that night I never wanted to do that again. You know what? If people have a problem with you and I being a Christian, it's their problem. 
It's not ours. You know what? Jesus was never offensive. You read the Gospels, he never was offensive. But that does not mean people did not take offense. And so you cannot control the way other people are going to react. And so I made a decision. I was not going to do that anymore. And as I began to really study and mature as a Christian, I've learned that there is no reason that we should ever be ashamed of the gospel. I want to share with you four things really quickly of reasons why you and I should not be ashamed of the gospel. Here's number one. The gospel is good news. What did I say? Good news. I would improve upon that and say it is great news. Isn't it? I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing that the gospel message is good news. It is great news. It is some of the best news that we could ever hear. And yet the Bible tells us that's what we're to do. As you become a child of God, whether you do it individually or you do it corporately as a church, one of the things that we are to do is to proclaim the gospel. And that doesn't always mean with our mouth and with our words or with a sermon or with a Bible study. It means in every way you live your life, you incorporate Christ. You incorporate God into your life and you will be sharing the gospel without ever saying a word. Can you say amen? Now sometimes you've got to speak up. Now I don't believe in this, oh, I'm never going to say anything for the Lord. I'm just going to live my life. Well, if you live your life right, I guarantee you you'll have an opportunity to say something. The Bible says, be ready always to give an answer to any man that asketh that for that calling that's within you. In other words, you, you live right, people are going to begin to ask. People will begin to ask, are you a Christian? Is there something going on in your life that I need to know about? Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus commissions the church and every child of God. This is our work. This is what we do. Matthew 28, verse 18, and Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, all authority has been given me in heaven and earth. Verse 19 goes on, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. We call it the Great Commission. It is sharing the great news of Jesus. I love that. The message that we have is a message that is unique. It is calling men and women out of whatever life they are living in to begin to be a part of a different kingdom. You know, it, the gospel is really about a different kingdom. It's not just trying to improve this life. It's not just trying to become politically active in all of these things. I'm not saying all that's wrong, but friends, this is, will never be God's kingdom. God is coming back to replace this kingdom. His kingdom will last forever, and you and I are a part of that. And it spreads by word of mouth. It's by invitation only. And God sends forth his people to extend the invitation to be a part of God's kingdom. So the gospel is what? Good news. The gospel, number two, is about salvation. I was hoping that everyone would be here because I have some news that I wanted to share with the church family. You guys are closer than my family. You are my family. And I wanted to share something, and I didn't want to have to say it again and again and again, something I found out a long time ago. And there's really nothing that can be done, but I'm dying. I'm dying. The doctors can't do anything. It's just a matter of time. I'm dying. And so are you. We're all dying. We're walking dead men. We're dead. But we don't act like it sometimes. We have a date with death. The Bible says that we're all sinners. We've all chosen to go contrary to the God of life. And we chose to follow 
the kingdom of darkness. And because that death passed upon all men, and there is nothing that you can do about it, there is no amount of resources that you can employ to try to escape that, to cure that. There is no cure for what ails us. We are under a death sentence. We have a date with death, and there is nothing we can do about it. That's why I love the gospel. Because the gospel acknowledges that. The gospel says it the way it is, that you and I are sinners, we deserve to die, and God is going to step in and he's going to save us. That's what the, the whole story of salvation is about. It is about that you and I don't have to die. I, when I became a Christian, I was absolutely convinced that I would never die, that I would see Jesus when he came. It was back in 1985. You know, 2,000 loomed out there. Surely life would not extend beyond that mysterious date of 2,000 and all of that. I was convinced that Jesus would come. And as time has come and gone, and I'm still here, I don't know what's going to happen. But here's what I, I, I confess to you. I don't want to die. I'm a coward. I mean, that, there's, there's probably no other, well, I shouldn't say that, no other news I could hear. There'd be worse than that. But that's got to be some of the worst news that you could ever hear, that you are dying. The Bible says... That because of sin, we don't live forever. God has given us three score and ten. You know what that adds up to? Seventy years. I am almost 54 years of age. So according to the Bible, we get three score and ten. That means I got 16 years left. 5,480 5, days. Worse if you count 360 days in a biblical year, then you've got to shave five off for each of that. A little over 5,500 days left. And I've got to tell you, everything within me says, that's not right. That's not what I was created for. You know what? We don't really figure out how to live well until we get older. I mean, that's the truth. For some of us, it takes us half of our life to be able to understand what's really important, and then it's just downhill from there. Oh, if you could, you know, if the young people could only know what I know, right? Isn't that what old people say? If they could only know the lessons that we've learned the hard way and all of that, their life would be so much better. And so, there it is. It's out there. That's pretty bad news, isn't it? You say, well, Pastor Bill, you're supposed to be sharing the good news. Well, you know what makes the good news so good is because the bad news is so bad. Yes, there's nothing we can do about it. But you know what? The Bible says that God intervenes. That God steps in to time and eternity and he, and he bridges that gap. And he said, yes, your days on this earth, in this life, might be limited but I've got something a whole lot better for you. In fact, it's what you were created for. The gospel is about saving men and women. By the way, it's not just for a life to come. It's also for this life because he offers us the abundant life. Talk to somebody that doesn't know Jesus whose life is falling apart, that's trapped in a world that's hurting and in relationships that are broken, that are addicted, and tell them, hey, I can give you eternal life, they'd look at you and think, are you from Mars? Why would I want more of this? Eternal life is about knowing Jesus. An abundant life, a great life. And that's what God gives to us. All right, so that's number two. The gospel is what? About salvation. Here's number three. The gospel is for everyone. That's what he says. In Romans chapter 1, verse 16, it goes back and it talks about that. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. You might be sitting here today, and you might be thinking, well, that's well and fine, preacher. You're saying that. That's for other people. No, no, no. There is no one here that the gospel is not for. It is not up to God. God has already done everything that He needs to do and provide for you to be saved. It is up to you. And you and you and you, it's up to us. 
God is no respecter of persons. He didn't say, I'm going to go to the cross for some and not others. I'm going to go to the cross for those sinners that didn't sin quite so much. When you see what Jesus did, he died for the sins of the whole world. And there is not a person you will ever meet that cannot have salvation in Jesus. Whether they are young or old, where they come from, how much money they make, how much they have, how much they don't have, how much they've sinned. I love that. The gospel is bigger than any of us. It will wrap you up, it will engulf you, and you can have that hope of eternal life. It's for everyone. That's why as long as I have breath, and as long as God calls me to be a pastor, I'm not going to let the church forget there are lost people out in our communities. When you got up and get, went out to your car and drove to this church, you passed by scores of people, hundreds and even thousands of people that woke up this morning with no knowledge of Christ. That doesn't mean they've never heard of Jesus, but they don't know him. And I'm convinced that if we share Jesus the way we should, if we are not ashamed of the gospel, if we will tell people the truth about God, you've got to be insane to turn away from the gospel. But I think what's happened is we've twisted it. We've hung so many things on the gospel. We've weighed it down. We've made it sound hard and complicated. And it makes it sound exclusive and all of that. But if we will just preach it the way Paul preached it, and men and women would see it for what it is as an open invitation for whosoever. I love that word. That's one of my favorite words in the Bible. Whosoever. You see it all through the Bible. Whosoever, whosoever. It is a great word. Because it includes you, and it includes me. Whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. That's what Acts 2 says. The gospel is for who? Everyone. Last, the fourth point I'd like to share with you, one of the reasons we should never be ashamed of the gospel, is that the gospel is the power of God in my life. You want to know how powerful God is? You can go to the edge of the Grand Canyon and you can look down in that great hole and some people are overwhelmed. You can stand at the foot of Everest and look up as far as the eye can see and some people are overwhelmed with the majesty of God. Some will hear beautiful music and they will sense the power of God. They will hear the oceans and they will sense the power of God. And all of that is true. The Bible says that the very heavens declare the glory of God. I don't, you know, where could you go that you cannot find God's glory there in some way? But I believe the greatest thing of all that declares the power of God is what he's done in our life. You know, this morning, we had a number of people travel to Hagerstown to attend the camp meeting to share their testimony. And it wasn't just our church, it was several churches. There was an hour of testimonies of people talking about how God changed their life. One of our own stood and talked about being trapped in alcohol and desperation, and depression, and the power of the gospel in our life. I believe that. I believe that that is what this is all about. It is God's power being displayed through us and in us. In Romans chapter 8, verse 10, the Apostle Paul gives us a glimpse of this power, and I want you to understand this, because this power is available to all. If you have been changed by the gospel, if the gospel has come into your life, this is what's available to you, not just to some, but to all of us. Here Paul says in Romans 8 verse 10, and if Christ is in you, what's he talking about there? 
How does Christ get in us? Through the Holy Spirit. As we die to the old life, the Bible says He raises us to live a brand new life. And He does that through the power of the Holy Spirit. He places the power of God. God in the Holy Spirit. Christ in us. The Holy Spirit comes in and raises us to walk in that newness of life. He says, if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the Spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, I want to stop right there. I know I've talked about this, and I think some of you have got it and some of you don't. Because when you really embrace this and you understand this, somebody ought to shout. The power of Christ. Let me back up and read it. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus, you know what he's talking about there? There came a time when Jesus gave up the ghost. He laid down his life, and there is the lifeless body of Jesus. They took him down off of the cross. They carried, they carried the dead body of Jesus and places him in a tomb. The creator of all the world lies dead. Nothing but a corpse. But the time came, he said, if I lay down my life, I will take it up again. Three days later, the Bible says, the Spirit of God awakened life within the body of Jesus. Think about the power, the power that is at work to raise a lifeless body and to infuse it with life. That's what God did. And that's what Paul's talking about. But if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, that's what happens at the new birth. The same power that raised Christ from the dead now lives in you. Man, you talk about power in your life. I mean, when we, call, when we call people up here and we pray and we say, Lord, fill them with your spirit. Give them power in their life. We do that according to the word of God. That's what God's plan is. You and I are walking tabernacles of the power of God. And that's what, that's what Paul's saying. The gospel is all about. It is the greatest demonstration of God's power to see someone that was dead in sin now alive to the righteousness of Christ. Man, you don't know it. You don't know it. You may not always realize it, but you are a trophy sitting on God's shelf. It represents what He can do in your life. Ephesians 2.10 talks about you're a masterpiece. I've always struggled with that word. You are a masterpiece of God. Because when I look in a mirror, I don't look like a masterpiece. But I look on the outside, and God looks on the inside. And he even says that in Ephesians about the church. That in the church, the manifold wisdom of God would be revealed. You know, all the way through the, through the Bible, it tells us that God holds up people. and says, this is what I can do. I mean, that's why he talks about David. I mean, I know David. I know, all the, I know the back story. I know all the things David did that he shouldn't have done. You know what God says? This is David who's perfect in all his ways. Wow! How could God do that? How could God say that? How could God say that about Moses, my serpent, my serpent, my servant, and all of that? He looks not at all the mistakes that we made, but he looks post mistakes, post forgiven, post sanctified, and he says, "Oh, they're perfect in all my ways." That's why is it uh, is it Jude now in him that is able to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy? How could God ever do that? Friends, he's already told us it is the gospel of God in our life. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit that dwells in you. I don't know about you, but we got no reason to be ashamed of the gospel. Can you say amen? I came across this some time ago. 
I want to invite the worship team to go on and get ready. We're going to sing that song. I love that song that we sang at a prayer time. I want to hear some more of it. I wanted to sing some more of it. Just come just as you are. But today I want to invite you no longer to be ashamed. And again, I'm not saying shame, but, you know, turning away, shy. Let's be bold. You remember we learned that when, when the Bible says that I will not be ashamed, what he's not saying is just that we won't be ashamed. What he's saying is we should be proud. That it, it, it accentuates, it, 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 it kind of defines the negative to accentuate the positive. But I want to invite you to make this declaration with me, if you will. As I said, I came across this a long time ago, and I think this, this embodies my belief as a Christian, my walk as a child of God. It is a declaration. A declaration means this may not be everything that I am yet, but it's what I aspire to achieve. And so here it is. I am dead. My power is powerless. My strength is impotent. My wisdom is foolishness. But oh, my name has been written in the book of life. My faith is in the Savior. My hope is in God. I no longer a citizen of the shameful, but a member of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have Holy Spirit power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of Christ. I won't look back, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is certain. I am finished and done with low living, side walking, small planning, colorless dreams, narrow vision, mundane talking, chintzy giving, and dwarf goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, promotions, positions, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, tops, recognized, regarded, rewarded, or praised. I now live in faith, stand in grace, and walk in patience. I now lift by prayer and labor by power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven. My road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few. My guide reliable, my mission is clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, lured, manipulated, enticed, or bribed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifice, hesitate in the presence of the adversary, negotiate at the table of the enemy, or ponder in the pool of popularity, or meander at the maze of mediocrity. I won't give up, shut up, let up, until I've stayed up, prayed up, and preached for the cause of Christ. I am his disciple. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all have heard. And when he comes back, he will have no problem recognizing me, for I have forgotten all that is in the past. I'm pressing on for the prize, the high calling of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Those seven words will change your life. They'll change the way you live. When we begin to make this declaration and live this declaration, we will have one of the most significant lives God, God desires us to have. So I hope, if that's your desire, I hope if you want to make that declaration with me, I want to invite you to stand as we sing. Be careful, because when you make a declaration like that, the devil is on notice. But I want you to know God is in you. God will fill you with his power. And God will fill you with his grace.